When you consume carbs and you have this big spike in glucose, it's easy to think that that is the root problem. Our glucose is supposed to spike when we have carbs. If it didn't spike when we had carbs, something would be very, very wrong, right? What we want to be looking for is, is that spike coming down? So the question is, are high spikes in glucose with subsequent lows just as bad as even moderately high glucose levels all the time. First, we have to understand glucose toxicity. This is the big problem, right? When glucose levels are so high and remaining high for so long that they're actually causing damage. Now, they cause damage in two very specific places that really have two very specific problems. They're quite different. Okay, when glucose levels are high constantly, eventually they damage pancreatic beta cells. When you damage the pancreatic beta cells, then you are reducing the ability for those pancreatic beta cells to produce insulin. So it starts a vicious cycle, right? So when you don't produce insulin, your glucose never really comes down. It stays elevated all the time. And then those high levels of glucose further impact the pancreatic beta cells and they produce even less insulin. But they're still trying to get the glucose down. So they're producing less insulin, but they're constantly secreting it, trying to deal with your glucose that's high. So it's like you have this constantly just low gradient of insulin all the time. Okay, the other side is the high levels of glucose damage the vascular system, the endothelial cells. And that's a different story. Okay, that's more like how it can stiffen arteries and cause problems there. Now on the other side of the coin, an acute quick spike in glucose is a perfectly normal thing, like I mentioned. When you eat carbohydrates, if you don't spike, there's a problem. So that spike and that fall is actually a good thing because it means that insulin is doing its job and it's bringing your glucose down to where it should be. Well, there's some interesting data when we look at a study from postgraduate medicine. Now, this is interesting because it looks at sort of the risks of chronic hyperglycemia that we have to address. During hyperglycemia, when you have chronically high levels of glucose, eventually what happens is you end up having quite a degree of oxidative stress, okay? The sheer metabolism of excess glucose alone leads to an increase in what are called superoxide radicals. Okay, so very, very potent free radicals that the body has to deal with. Ordinarily, this isn't a big deal. Well, it's a big deal, but ordinarily the body can deal with it. And one of the ways it deals with it is through glutathione. Okay, but the problem is that high levels of glucose impair glutathione too. So high levels of glucose soak up and take up a lot of what is called NADPH. NADPH, we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty of it, but NADPH is required to process glucose, but it's also required to regenerate glutathione. You see where I'm going with this, right? So you have more free radicals and less ability to even deal with them in the first place. So you end up with literal glucose toxicity. And then the third thing they looked at in this study was advanced glycation end products. When you have high amounts of sugar, you're essentially glycolating and like hardening proteins, like caramelizing an onion. Now, this obviously makes this situation bad. Now, one of the big problems we face here is something called metabolic memory. When this glycation occurs, it's not like reducing your blood sugar or glucose automatically fixes the problem. That damage is done and it's called metabolic memory. But it's easy to get deterred by that and discouraged and some of the things that you can look at, how do you increase autophagy to sort of correct that? So once you've already got your blood sugar under control, you wanna kind of repair the damage that's done. I can anecdotally say that based upon some of the research I've looked at in my own experience, that perhaps doing some things like occasional fasting and definitely zone two, zone three type cardio and moving the body, but intermittent fasting where you're able to give your body a break and actually go through more autophagy and stimulate that more, you could potentially take those glycated damaged proteins and use them as fuel through the autophagy process. So you're recycling the more decrepit proteins and potentially allowing them to be used as fuel so that you fuel the more powerful, healthy cells. So try doing little bits of fasting if you're kind of at that stage, but I digress, let's move on. We need to talk about insulin resistance. Do acute spikes in glucose actually cause insulin resistance like a chronically high level of glucose would. And it's actually pretty interesting to look at. The Journal of Nutrients published a paper that found that high carbohydrate diets and high fat diets ended up having about the same level of insulin sensitivity. 
that's wild because most of the time when you look at the low carb world, they're going to say, okay, well, a low carb, high fat diet is better for insulin sensitivity than a high carb diet. I think the operative thing that we need to look at here is the overconsumption, period, right? We do overconsume carbohydrates. There's nothing wrong with a moderate amount of carbohydrates that is respective to how much you move and the fuel that you're using, right? But when we start overeating carbohydrates, which we probably have been for the lion's share of the last 50 years, then we do run into a problem. Okay, there's also the question that needs to be asked that when you are doing lower carb, who cares if you're insulin sensitive or not? Because you're not really consuming carbohydrates and a little bit of insulin resistance could actually be a good thing because it's peripheral insulin resistance and it's actually allowing glucose to be shuttled to the right place. So the reason I say this is that it's very nuancy, right? Glucose is going to stay stable, however it should stay stable. But when you have these spikes and these falls, that's not the end of the world. I put a link down below for Cygnos, which is a continuous glucose monitor that allows you to use their really cool technology to monitor your glucose, but also look at where your specific range should be. Okay, the reason I like to use a CGM is I like to see what spikes me, and I'm not always as concerned with the spike as I am with where am I falling, generally speaking, and am I coming back down the way that I should? Okay, the problem that you start to face is you have these spikes, but you're not coming down very fast. And it doesn't mean that you should be out looking for spikes, but understanding how your body works. And the cool thing is, is the technology with Cygnos and wearing a continuous glucose monitor lets you kind of see, oh, okay, I had something that spiked me. Maybe I shouldn't be eating that, but it's also gonna give me alerts to say, hey, your glucose is spiking. You should go move and utilize your body so the glucose soaks up. Because I'm gonna give you some practical tips towards the end of this video on ways that you could modulate your glucose a little bit with this as well. So that link down below will save you 15% off. So use that code that's down below to check out Cygnos, get a continuous glucose monitor, and use some really interesting coaching systems with Cygnos to help you understand your body a little bit more because it's all about data. So again, that link is down below. Pretty darn cool to be able to wear a continuous glucose monitor and understand how you respond to foods. So in the world of insulin resistance though, not all carbohydrates are created equal. Okay, this is what's interesting. And actually a CGM kind of comes into play here. What about fructose? Fructose is a different kind of carbohydrate. Well, there's an interesting paper on this. This was published in the journal Clinical Investigation. Okay, it took a look at subjects and for 10 weeks, they had them consume 25% of their total calories from either glucose or another group from fructose. Very wild, both groups gained the same amount of weight. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, that was thermodynamics and they both ate the same amount of calories, right? But what was different was the fructose group ended up having more visceral fat they ended up having more de novo lipogenesis, meaning they created more new fat. They had a decrease in insulin sensitivity and an overall increase in serum insulin levels, meaning their body was producing more insulin. So what the heck's going on here? Why is fructose different? Well, fructose is a different situation because fructose can only be stored in the liver. So with glucose, when there's excess glucose, essentially it can get soaked up by the muscles as long as there's room, right? A lot more room. Fructose, it's not bad, it's not evil, it's not a problem unless you overdo it. And the ability to overdo fructose is much easier than the ability to overdo glucose. You can look at epidemiological data and you can start seeing like, okay, maybe we started developing a serious obesity problem over the last 50 years because people that are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s now were of the generation where they started consuming a lot of high fructose corn syrup, a lot of fructose laden beverages because we were going through a low fat craze and trying to steer things that way. Maybe they were consuming so much fructose that their body couldn't handle it, right? We're starting to steer away from that a little bit more now, a little less high fructose corn syrup and stuff. Maybe it's gonna take some time for that position to correct itself. But then we have to get into a very important piece and that's surrounding the world of fat burning, which I know you're interested in because you're probably watching this video because you're concerned with glucose and ultimately being overweight, right? One thing that is for certain is that insulin does impair lipolysis. It does stop fat loss. Now, if you were to take this little cut of this video, you would totally nail me to a wall and say, Thomas DeLauer is denying physics and calories in, calories out matter, and he's saying they don't and that insulin stops fat loss. 
In the moment, insulin does stop fat loss. It is a pro-growth signal. Absolutely stops fat loss. Okay, chronically elevated levels of insulin would definitely impede fat loss. Now, a spike in insulin is not going to necessarily impede fat loss throughout the course of the day. It's going to stop it at that moment. I eat some carbohydrates, blood sugar spikes, insulin goes up to manage it. I'm not burning fat in that moment because I'm storing fuel, no problem. But then that sugar spike drops, insulin levels drop, and I'm back to fat burning mode. Those peaks and troughs are actually quite advantageous for fat burning. If you're chronically high, then it might be harder to tap into fat burning. There was another study published in the Journal of Postgraduate Medicine. They published that when body fat levels are up, so is the severity of insulin resistance. The more body fat, the more severity of insulin resistance. This sort of infers that the more fat we have, the more insulin resistant we become. And it also infers that the more insulin resistant we become, the more fat we build because it turns into a vicious cycle, right? If, since it's progressive and the more fat we have, the more insulin resistance we have and vice versa, yeah, we can see there is probably a correlation there. So we dive deeper because that is correlational. That is not 100% but we can look at some mechanisms and draw some potential conclusions. The Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism took a look at skeletal muscle cultures from healthy people that are lean and from obese people. And they found that in obese muscle tissue, the rate of fat oxidation was significantly less. Okay, so obese people had less ability to burn fat. They also had less carnitine palmitoyl transferase one. So they had less transporter that actually allowed them to use fat in the first place and they had less in the way of citrate synthase, which is the first step in the Krebs cycle and very important for fatty acid utilization. So it's clear in muscle tissue that when you're obese, you even have less ability to use fat. And that could be happening at a very mechanistic local level, but it also could be because it's impeded by insulin. Now we move into another interesting category that's very important. This one, it gets a little twisted. What about inflammation? We know that high levels of glucose can trigger inflammation, okay? What ends up happening is when you have an enlarged fat cell or a fat cell that is growing, these fat cells sort of leak things. They're, they're not, it's not good when they're growing a lot. When they're growing a lot, they're leaking adipokines, they're leaking inflammation, okay? This in and of itself is a problem. But when you have chronic hyperglycemia along with this, glucose levels that are elevated all the time, it makes it even more pronounced. It makes this leaking of inflammatory cytokines even more, these adipokines. Now, the other thing we have to look at is that when your glucose levels are high, your body is sensing that you have too much fuel on hand. Too much fuel isn't good, right? Too much fuel tells your body that, ah, oh, we need to, we're gonna secrete inflammation. Like when you eat, you have inflammation. Just the process of having fuel available externally is going to secrete an inflammatory response or trigger an inflammatory response. What am I getting at with this? Chronically high levels of glucose seemingly cause inflammation, right? Pretty, pretty certain with that. What about acute spikes? Here's what's wild. There was a study published in the journal Circulation that took a look at subjects that were glucose intolerant, that were like kind of somewhat insulin resistant, and healthy subjects. And they fed them carbohydrates. When they gave them a glucose spike, both groups had a spike in inflammation. So I guess carbs are inflammatory. Yeah, they actually are. But what they did find is that the glucose intolerant group had an even higher spike in inflammation. So what it shows us is that the higher the spike and the longer the spike, the more the inflammation, which really doesn't come as much of a surprise because whenever we eat, we will have an inflammatory response. You could probably say the same when someone consumes fat. Now what I wanna do is I wanna give you some practical tips with this because I've given a lot of information here. The first practical tip is of course, monitor your glucose and see what foods make you spike and might make you stay spiked. That is number one. You need to see what spikes you and possibly attenuate that if that's a problem. Secondly, you do need to watch within that if you're dropping okay. Okay, one of the things that I really recommend is have very clear defined meals with very clear defined gaps in between. I think that is a serious problem that we don't deal with, okay? These troughs, these gaps in between meals are when fat burning actually occurs. Insulin levels are low, glucagon comes up, it's the troughs where the magic happens. Allow yourself to have troughs. I think more and more and more and more people are stepping away from the six, seven, eight meals a day kind of thing, like constantly graze. 
have gaps in your meals so your body has an opportunity to utilize fat when your insulin levels are low. Also have an opportunity to have more insulin sensitivity, right? That's very important no matter what kind of dietary strategy you're doing. The other piece that's very important is moving your body. Now, I did a video on this a while ago. The sheer contraction of your muscles actually stimulates what is called an insulin independent uptake of glucose, meaning glucose goes into the cell independent regardless of insulin levels because the sheer contraction sucks the glucose in. It's a very simple way of putting it. So moving after eating carbs is going to decrease the amount of insulin your pancreas needs to secrete. So if you're already dealing with high levels of glucose and you're trying to combat this and you still like carbs, you eat your carbs, but move afterwards so you give your pancreas a little bit of a break. That makes it so it doesn't have to produce as much and maybe has a chance to actually recycle. Another thing is do things that you can to mitigate the spikes if you know that you stay high, right? Consuming protein as the very first part of your meal, I sound like a broken record, is one of the most important things that you can do because it's going to attenuate the glucose spike. It's gonna slow down how much, how quickly the glucose absorbs and it's gonna give yourself a gentle bell curve to where maybe if you're a little bit insulin resistant, your body can deal with it a little bit better. A couple little tricks that I talk about too, apple cider vinegar with meals could potentially be helpful. Chromium supplementation can potentially be helpful as well. Okay, and then there's other little things that you can do as well. Obviously going for a walk is really good. Uh, also consuming fiber, soluble fiber, can slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates as well. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.